it's an image that still inspires awe. From space, planet Earth looks simple, a colorful and peaceful orb. But life on planet Earth is anything but simple. That's because at its root, life is complex, a maze of matter, intelligence, and emotion. But perhaps even more complex than our world are the questions that plague it. Where do we come from? Why are we here? But with so much to occupy our minds, good and bad, they're the kind of questions that often get put on the shelf. And yet, shelves are now full of books claiming they have the answer to these most fundamental questions of life. Go into any bookstore today and you'll notice there's an awful lot being written about God. Most books claim he doesn't exist. And if he does, well, he's certainly not great. It's called the new atheism, and it's tearing up the bestseller lists. Though broadcaster and columnist Michael Korn says there's nothing new about it. You read all of these guys, you know, Harris and Hitchens and Dawkins and the rest, and you're waiting for something new, and you finish and think, uh, you know, where's the beef? Isn't that the phrase they use? I mean, there's, there's nothing new there at all. But we have modern publishing. We also have the cult of the celebrity. So now you write a book about atheism, and a dumbed down, numbed down North American and European culture say, oh, golly, this is brand new. No, you're just too dumb to have read it before. It's always been there. Disbelief in God has been around just as long as belief. And so have the nagging questions. They'll just come out with the same old cliches, you know. Um, oh, golly, you know, um, uh, Crusades, Inquisition, Galileo. They can't even spell Galileo, but Galileo, um, you know, Second World War. Um, there are some bad people who call themselves Christian. Big deal. Why, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? So all of these extremely basic questions you can quite easily deal with. That's their level. But if atheism is nothing new, then why are these books so popular? To get to the heart of that question, I go to the hotbed of the debate, Oxford University. I first encountered Richard Dawkins back in the 1980s when he and I debated together in a student debating society. And it was very, very interesting. But I just felt there was much more that needed to be said than what we said on that occasion. And their debates continue to this day. Dawkins is synonymous with the new atheism movement. His book, The God Delusion, pretty much sums up his viewpoint. Faith is a delusion, and it's time to wake up. But Alistair McGrath also has something to say. A former atheist with a PhD in microbiology and theology, he's in a unique position to deconstruct Dawkins' arguments and has written several books on the subject. Atheists are worried. Religion should have disappeared. This aggressiveness, this dogmatism, is really an attempt to get rid of something that should have disappeared if they were right a long time ago. Indeed, there has been no upsurge in atheism. Church attendance may be dwindling, but only 7% of Canadians call themselves atheists, a number nearly unchanged since 1975. Many may have reservations about God and organized religion, but it seems we haven't given up on faith. Why? As founding director of McGill's Centre for Law, Medicine and Ethics, Margaret Somerville has had to grapple with the most difficult questions of life, including what it means to be human. She too has debated Dawkins and says his presumption there is no supernatural is in conflict with a genuine human instinct in all of us. Now what that's called is that feeling of belonging to some greater whole is called transcendence. And most people traditionally, most of us want to have that kind of experience. I mean, it's a very rich life experience. It's an experience, I would genuinely call it, of the mystery of life. Transcendence may be hard to define and even harder to prove, but atheism excludes the idea altogether. But you've got a choice of two basic presumptions. One is that there is something else. I call it the great unknown, but it's sort of, it's God. And the other is there is nothing else. There is no God. There is no great unknown. Now, neither side can prove that there is or there isn't. So those are two equally feasible basic presumptions. And what Richard Dawkins is, he's chosen one. And for example, the strict fundamentalists have chosen the other. And of course, they're in a head-on clash. 
It's a clash that started in the 19th century, but one that has only recently picked up real steam. What makes the new atheism, well, new, is that it's so aggressive. Not only is faith a delusion, it's evil. McGrath coins it atheist fundamentalism, and he says it's just as dangerous. Dawkins' real agenda here is to exploit the public anxiety about Islamism, the kind of people who will fly their planes into buildings, suicide bombers. And he wants to be able to argue religious people are like those. That's why they're so dangerous. Now, obviously, that's a gross extrapolation. Dawkins' book has been panned by many critics, including fellow atheists. While he's no theologian, he is considered one of the top evolutionary biologists in the world. And he's got a lot of backup. Along with Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, and Christopher Hitchens, they jokingly refer to themselves as the Four Horsemen. Dawkins started a club for atheists called the Brights. So where does that leave everyone else? We have the tradition of, of Thomas Aquinas and C.S. Lewis and, and, and Cardinal Newman. I mean, just some of the Dostoevsky, and, uh, but we're dumb, we're dumb. Uh, there are clever Christians, there are foolish Christians. There are clever atheists, there are foolish atheists. That, uh, intellect is not really the issue here. And if we did add, add up uh, who are the, the clever ones, you might find that we have the majority. But that isn't the issue. It's, it's not intelligence, it's truth. Dawkins' book claims to have the truth, and perhaps his biggest wingman is Charles Darwin, the father of evolution. Darwinism is a scientific theory. What Dawkins does is to try and make it into a worldview. He argues that if Darwin is right, there is no God, there is no transcendent. These are simply things we've invented for evolutionary reasons. According to Darwin, all species of life evolved over time, from one or a few ancestors, through a process of natural selection. Though evolution is now the status quo in most science labs and classrooms, Dawkins takes it one step further and says, Darwin is evidence there is no God. But is that taking it one step too far? That's one of the reasons why so many scientists are uneasy about what Dawkins is doing. He is taking a scientific theory which is provisional, it may have to be changed, and saying, no, we can construct our entire understanding of the entire world on the basis of this theory. That's extrapolation from science to what many people call scientism. But Dawkins is certainly not alone. And the God debate has moved into the laboratory. Strange, says McGrath, considering where science originally came from. The whole scientific enterprise emerged from religious context. Sure, there have been tensions over the years, but that's like a family squabble. The point is, there's a common history there. One of Christianity's greatest gifts to modern Western culture is the scientific enterprise. I was viewed as an intellectual terrorist. But this family squabble is about to get ugly. Tomorrow on 100 Huntley Street... This is not a scientific issue, but a political issue. We look at the God exclusion in science and why Ben Stein is expelling the Darwin dogma.